You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 8, Discovering Phaethon and Sonnet 7. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never, never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and more importantly for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. After a couple of weeks recording two episodes a week, I was hoping for a little respite, even as I suspected that Sonnet 7 would be so straightforward that I'd go for a bonus Sonnet 8. Boy, was I wrong. Halfway through analyzing Sonnet 7, I discovered for the first time that there's an important thread running through the sonnets that I've completely missed before. This oversight just goes to underscore something that I've been saying for years. If you're not familiar with Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis, you're going to miss out in your sonnet experience. While I don't really recall the steps that led me to understanding that the sonnet sequence is framed by Golding's translation of the tale of Narcissus and Echo, I certainly remember the wonder I experienced reading it for the first time when I already had a good idea of what the sonnets were doing. Today, while putting together notes for this episode, I realized something else. Shakespeare's references to the sun, the sun god, and the seasons are directly taken from Golding's translation of the tale of Phaethon, the son of Phoebus. There's far too much going on for me to include the details in this episode, so it looks like I might need a separate episode after I've done some more research, and I may have to revisit some of the earlier sonnets. For those of you who are interested, and I warmly recommend this book to all Shakespeare scholars, Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis was published in 1904 as Shakespeare's Ovid, and is available for free from the Open Library. You'll find the link in the description of this episode read it there, or download it from there, please consider throwing them a dollar or two. They're doing amazing work and it's all donation based. Just like me. To summarize my main takeaway from my initial contact with the story, Phoebus is the sun god, who on meeting and acknowledging his son for the first time, unintentionally granted him permission to drive his chariot, which Phoebus knew would end with his son dead. He was distraught when his son was ultimately killed by Zeus as a punishment for almost bringing about the destruction of the world. Off the top of my head, and without deep contemplation, I'm confident that this plays a major role in the mini-story told by sonnets 33, 34, and 35. It's also clear to me that the seasons referenced in the sequence are the personification surrounding Phoebus when Phaethon meets him in the sun god's palace. Right. Let's analyze Sonnet 7. Lo, in the Orient, when the gracious light lifts up his burning head, each under eye doth homage to his new appearing sight, serving with looks his sacred majesty. The gracious light in the East refers to the sun god Phoebus. As always in the sequence, references to the sun also refer to Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, but here also refers to the reader who literally and figuratively throws light on the sonnets in order to read them. The under eyes are Narcissus's eyes, which can be both the eyes of the bard, or of the sonnet reflections, or of the reader. New appearing sight is interesting, because Shakespeare's sonnet reflections always appear new, even when they're old or have been read before, just as the sun appears new at the beginning of each day. The reader's sight is also new appearing, probably because the sonnets are static and have no memory of being read before. In Middle English, the word homage referred to the ceremony of a vassal declaring himself his lord's servant, and a vassal, a servant or young squire, denotes an apprentice. With this in mind, the sun rising in the east is the reader's eye, or the light falling on the opening page, and each under eye, or sonnet, declares himself for Shakespeare whenever it's read, whether by Shakespeare himself or by the reader. Each sonnet does homage to the memory of Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, who appears anew in each one. From the other side of the sonnet looking glass, when the gracious light of the reader lifts up the burning head of the sonnet, each reader's eye reading the sonnet is declaring itself the sonnet's servant, or at the very least subjecting itself to the ideas of each sonnet during the act of reading. Either way, serving with looks is very important. 
Neither Shakespeare, nor the sonnets, nor the reader are served if the sonnets are not read. And having climbed the steep up heavenly hill, resembling strong youth in his middle age. Heavenly hill refers to the location of the spring in which Narcissus sees his reflection. I suspect here that resembling might imply reassembling. His middle age could be a number of things. Shakespeare is embedding his youth in the sonnets, as well as the memories of his son, while he is writing in his middle age. If Sonnet 7 describes the reading of the sequence, or even of a single sonnet, then the middle age might refer to the reader experiencing the middle of the sequence, or the middle of the current sonnet. If my latter supposition is correct, then it's more likely that Sonnet 7 is specifically describing the act of reading Sonnet 7. Yet mortal looks adore his beauty still, attending on his golden pilgrimage. Adore comes from Old French and Latin meaning to worship or pray, in particular prayer by speech. So here we see living beings worshipping beauty, which in sonnet parlance meant Shakespeare and Shakespeare's ideas and creative powers, both by reading the sonnets and by speaking their words out loud. Attending comes from the Old French attendre, and in Middle English meant to apply one's mind or efforts. Golden takes us back to Sonnet 3's This Thy Golden Time, Shakespeare's youth captured in the sonnets. Pilgrimage takes us back to the dedication of the sonnet sequence and Sonnet 6's Departure. It refers to the sacred journey that the sonnet sequence must take after the death of Shakespeare's physical body. With all of that in mind, what we're seeing in these two lines is that reading the sonnets out loud is a form of prayer, and by praying in this way we are applying or lending our energies to the golden pilgrimage which is the sonnet's sacred journey through eternity. But when from highmost pitch with weary car, like feeble age he reeleth from the day, the eyes for duteous now converted are from his low tract, and look another way. Pitch meant slope, degree, or inclination. Car refers to Phoebus's chariot. To reel connoted swaying, rocking, and being unsteady. Tract meant both track or course and a little book. All this comes together to describe the weakening of the sun towards the end of the day and the eyes no longer looking in his direction, which describes the effect of reading on the sonnets. If the reader becomes weary and looks away, or turns the page, or closes the book, the sonnets will cease to serve their master as the reader ceases to serve the sonnet. So thou thyself outgoing in thy noon, and looked on diest, unless thou get a son. Shakespeare, at the midpoint of his life, is dying without his son to continue his legacy, or without the sonnets to replace him. Sonnet 7 is dying without a new sonnet to replace it to keep the reader's attention. The sonnet sequence is dying without a reader to play the part of the sun god. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. And please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender?